It's nice to see you all this evening. Um, who's never seen me before? Because there's always new people in this church. It's like crazy. It's my first time too, so well, no, welcome. <clears throat> you know, just that, that little text on, from James about prayer for the sick. It says, if any is sick among you, what should you do? Call for the elders. Don't wait for them to come to you. The faith is in the calling of the elders. That's part of their job. That's why we stepped into eldership. One of them was to come and pray for the sick. And if you say the elders never come and pray for me and I'm sick, say, did you call them? Because that's actually what the text says, and that's where the faith is. So that's just for free to throw in. You know that song there, it says, God turns graveyards into gardens. Did you sing it? I hope at the end of the talk tonight, you might say, that's me. Because I today can say, that's me. I was a graveyard that God has turned into a garden. Well, I think it's a garden. My Bible says so. You know, most Bibles are really boring. They're black, but I wanted one that spoke of life. So there we go. Father, we, we ask that as we gather around the text this evening, that you would be with us, that you would speak to us, that you would encourage us, that you would love us. That we'd walk out of this building tonight knowing that you love us. And nothing can change that. So be with us, we pray. We're reading from 1 John chapter 3, first letter of John chapter 3, first 10 verses. I'll read them. And then we're going to sit primarily in one verse. And I'm reading from the NIV because I think it has one word in it that is really powerful to explaining something. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. That's a line worth underlining. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Last weekend, Easter weekend. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. This is how we know who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and their sister. It can be, seem to be a fairly complicated text. Um, and one of the things about reading John, especially this first letter of John, is John cycles around the same subject over and over and over again. Um, right in the beginning, he says, if you say you don't sin, then you're a liar. He doesn't want anyone to sin. But if you do sin, there's an advocate speaks on our behalf, someone who's stepped into our place. And the reality is this, is that God, not only in John in this text dealing with God working in a, in a cyclic way, but God deals with us like that. He takes you, he deals with something in your life and you think you have victory and you live beautifully and then in three, four years time, he comes around to that thing again because he takes it deeper because he's wanting to fully eradicate it. And a few years later, you come around sometimes to that same thing again, especially when there's been pain and when there's been hurt and trauma, God often cycles back. He's done it in my life multiple times, cycling back. So when you read in chapter 1, talking about sin, he says we can have fellowship with God. Even though we say we sin, he says anybody that is of sin is not of God. But when you do sin, he's provided someone for us. He's saying, 
in that imperfection of where we are, we can still have fellowship with God. And as he cycles back again, he's dealing on a deeper level, taking us down. He wants to increase our intimacy, increase our relationship, increase our connection with Jesus. And he deals at a deeper level and he keeps doing that. Don't think that when you read a text like this, that you are disqualified because you sinned five minutes before you walked in. Jesus has provided a way for us to have connection with God. And that's why we celebrate Easter. All right? There is no resurrection if there's no death. And we do not preach Jesus. We preach Jesus crucified. Because that's where our freedom comes. Now, I'm not going to say any more about sin at this stage. Because this text is so big. But I want to come primarily to one verse. Can we put up verse 1 there again? Can you read that with me and can you read it loud as an act of worship? Look at those words. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Isn't that a great verse? So in June 1981, it's nearly 42 years ago, I wandered, well not wandered, I kind of found myself in a church building very similar to this, a little bigger, concrete floors. Church was called the Invisible Church. It's where Chris and Merrill were at. Um, and I wasn't looking for Jesus. I heard the music was good. I got invited in. And here I, I arrived at this church. Um, pretty street smart. I won't tell you my whole testimony but a pretty rough person. I just turned 22, two weeks after my 22nd birthday. And I walked in, and our, our pastor, Carl, preached the gospel. He's preaching from Romans. And we, I didn't know what happened, but I found myself kneeling in the front. I wasn't, God found me. I was not interested in God. He found me, and he saved me. You know, there's a whole lot into that, but I, don't, I haven't got time to go into it. But on the second, uh, that was the Sunday night. On the Tuesday night, I met with Carl in his office. And uh, I said, I, something happened on that Tuesday night. I need you to explain to me what happened. And he took me through Romans, the, the old Roman road, and explained salvation to me. And it was the days we still had chalkboards. Does anyone know what a chalkboard is? You still have them? <laughs> took a piece of chalk. And I said, Carl, I wouldn't have said that two days ago, but actually that's what I've been looking for my whole life. And I drew a line on the concrete floor. I put my heels like this and I drew a line. And I said, I'm never going back across that line. That's what that line on that tattoo is, that first line there. But then he did this to me. He said, I want you to go and I want you to read the first letter of John every day for a month. It's five chapters. Every day for a month, I want you to read it. I said, uh, that's good, but can I have a Bible, please? So he gave me a Bible. And I began to read the first letter of John every single day. But I got stuck. Because every time I got to this idea that of God as a father, I got stuck. So I want to tell you about four father figures in my life and why I got stuck. And maybe you can identify with some of these and maybe you can't. First is my real dad. Now, he was not a very pleasant man at all. I use other language when, when I'm in other company. He was not a good man. He was abusive. He was an alcoholic. Beat my mom up. All sorts of things. Left me locked in a car while he got drunk. My mom divorced him. And then when I was in first grade, he was killed in a car accident. So my real dad had no connection to me, no love for me, no affirmation for me, none of that. Okay, scenario one. Is that okay? I'm not going to unpack all of it. I just want to try to get through it. Went to live with, my mom and I went to live with my grandparents. My grand, the sweetest woman the world has ever met. My grandfather, a tyrant. Now, no offense to redheads. But he was one of those with fire engine red hair with those massive freckles and he lost his temper on a fairly regular basis. 
And cowboys don't cry. You cry, I'll give you something to cry about. Do not show emotions in this house, you know, that type of stuff. Can I move on? I'll say this. I had the privilege of leading him to the Lord a few months after I got saved. So that was, that was glorious. <clears throat> Third scenario, my mom, when I'm in a, a freshman, decides she's remarrying. Fairly decent guy. I was at boarding school, whatever. But never really had time for me. If I came, when I came home for holidays, it was like just stay out of the house, kind of disconnected. He's the, he's the only one that really punched me in the face one day. But anyway, that's another thing. Fourth scenario is I went to boarding school, to a Catholic, church, a Catholic boarding school, and our house fathers, the ones that looked after our dormitories, were not very good. And I am a victim of sexual abuse while I was at a Catholic boarding school. That was a fourth father. So I have four fathers, figures, one, uh, some real ones, None of them actually give me an idea of really what a father is. They tell me they're distant. They tell me they're abusive. They tell me they're absent. They tell me they're not caring. They tell me that whatever. That's my picture of a father. So I jump into a text and I read, How great is the love the father has lavished on us. I can't make that connection. Now, I don't know if there's anybody... Uh, among us here this evening has that. But God has a way of breaking in. So I decided, no one told me about retreats or anything like that. I decided I was going to go away for a day or two with my Bible. And I want to say, God, you need to talk to me. Because I'm not getting this. I'm sort of making this. But as soon as I get to the father bit, this is not what I'm experiencing. And... God gave me a revelation. Now, there were no computers in those days, 1981. They might have just been coming out. There was no internet, so the idea of what we call a download is just not an existing word. But God downloaded into my life that he was my dad, and I got it. Just like that. Supernaturally. I was once a graveyard... But God made it a garden. I once was an orphan, but God brought me into his family and said, I will be your father and you will be my son. It's an Old Testament prophecy. It's a word prophesied over Jesus. It's a word prophesied and given to millions of people over the centuries. And if you're in that place, then God the Father can do that for you as well. God is a father. Now, I've had to go for therapy for some things. I've been for healing for things. But I've never had to deal with that issue ever again. Because God did that. Now, I know, I've been in ministry, I don't know, 36 years, whatever it is, that sometimes God does things supernaturally, instantaneously, never struggle again. And sometimes there's an ongoing battle. I experienced that in my life. I'm sure you've experienced that in your life. That's why this is so important. Because if in this space, you can be vulnerable. In this space, if people can know you. In this space, if you can acknowledge your weaknesses, then God will be made great. Because in our weakness, what? He is? If you don't acknowledge your weakness, it's very hard for him to be strong in your life. It's when you acknowledge weakness. And if you acknowledge it by yourself, just locked in your room, there are times God does miracles, and there's times the enemy just has a go at you and says, that's a lot of rubbish. That's why this, this is why this is important. Teach us to pray, Jesus. How did he, what did he say? My father, our father, us. So the core idea that I think is coming out in this text, as I've read this, and 1 John is still my favorite book in the Bible, and this verse is my favorite verse in the Bible. It sits above my desk in my office. My daughters wrote it out on an old chalkboard, and it's written there. 
How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God for that is what we are. Can you say the word lavished? lavished. You know, it's a word, you get your tongue around that word. When you read yeah, ESV and CSB, it's like what the Lord has given us. It's kind of such an insipid word. It's a good word, but it's not like lavished. Lavished is a good word, and we'll come back to that in a moment. But the core, identity, core idea here is this idea of identity. Now, when you get to verse 8, the reason the Son of Man appeared was to destroy the works of the enemy. Actually, one of the key things that the enemy wants to keep away from us is who we are. Who, what is our identity, and how do, through that identity, how do we connect to God? And when Jesus comes and wins a victory, he, we get adopted into a family. We get new identity. And identity is one of the greatest struggles currently in our world. Well, I think it's been for centuries. Who am I? How do I fit? But the father comes and says, no, you are my daughter. You are my son. And actually, you fit perfectly well into this world that I've prepared for you. Because I'm with you. We'll come to that again in a moment. Our identity is fully linked to who He is. Can I say that again? Your identity is fully linked to who He is. The moment the devil can separate that, see, He's not such a good father. He's not, he's not really a great God. He, he, we, we begin to struggle. So this is who we are, and this is who we are becoming. That's what that text says. One day, we'll see him and we will be like him. So we are, I am a son, and one day I will come into the fullness of that, and I will be like him, with him for all time, which is that whole issue of discipleship. I'm with him. And then I'm becoming like him. And we become like the one we behold. That word see, we'll come to it in a moment. That's why we pr practice the way. Why? Be with him. See him. Behold him. Be transformed. Every day, till the one day, and there is a day coming. There is a day coming when everything will be wrapped up. There is a day coming when we will be like him. There is a day coming where all trauma and tears and pain and sorrow and broken will be done for. There is a day coming. Until then, this verse is really, really important to us. So in the broadness of this text, sin is broken so that we can have fellowship with God. And sin is totally being eradicated so that we will finally become everything that God wants us to become. Are we okay? You can know everything about God. You can quote every verse in the Bible. But if you don't know God... You're missing something massive. Give yourself to knowing God, and not only to knowing God, give yourself to being known by God. My early morning prayer, five mornings at least of the, of the week, is get up early, early, weigh my coffee beans, grind my coffee beans, make my coffee, sit with my coffee in my, by myself, no prayer, no, and my, my, my single prayer is, Lord, here I am. Love me. That's my prayer every morning. Here I am, Lord. Love me. I feel so soppy for a son, but it's so beautiful. Let's look at this verse. Can we unpack it just a little bit? See what great love the Father has lavished us. See, that word means to behold, to look intently, to pay attention. It's not like, oh, see. 
When we want to know that God is still working, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, go look at birds, go look at flowers, go look at grass, see, behold, observe, notice, see. It's not just like see. This is a deep word. Um, Kurt Thompson, uh, Christian psychiatrist, neuroscientist, I love you, he says, we, learn, we have to learn to pay attention to what we pay attention to. We have to become aware of where we're paying attention. And this sort of verse brings us on, we need to pay attention to what God is doing, what God is saying, and who God is to me. Pay attention. See what great love. This is a, this what great is a wonderful word. I'm not good at pronouncing Greek. Potopen. It actually means from another place. Otherworldly. See what great love, this otherworldly love. It's not the, the love that we know here. It's an otherworldly love. It's from another place. That's what that word says. We have to take notice of that. Because for many of us, me included, as it applies to God as a father, that word love can be a, a messed up word as well. How many times? I mean, I've got two daughters. One same age as Dana. Come home and say, you know, Dad, this guy seemed to be interested in me. And then he, he said, if you love me, then. That's called manipulation. And if, you, if we've experienced that, then this word love can be mixed up. That's why we need to observe, take note, be aware, pay attention to this kind of love because it's not the normal. It's another kind of love. All right? And this love, the word, its root word is agape, but actually if you take it into the Old Testament, it's linked to this word hesed, which is such an amazing word. And I wish that we could spend days unpacking the word hesed. And if you want to read it, there's a great book called Inexpressible uh, on this word hesed, which the Bible translates love, but it always got other words with it because there's no word that really explains it. And when they wrote the Greek Old Testament, they had to find a word for hesed, and they couldn't find one. They used the word agape, trying to explain that word. And today, we use it in the sense of the self-sacrificing giving of yourself love. And it's totally right. But it's so much more. In May last year, I spent time with an Old Testament Hebrew scholar for about an hour and a half talking around the word hesed. And he said, it means that God is stuck to you. The kind of love that is here is the love where God is stuck to you. In, in kind of neuro or psychology language, it's secure love attachment would be a good word. Anyone you heard that language? There's a secure love attachment to God. He's delighted to be with us. God doesn't wake up in the morning and think, oh God, I've got to hang with these people again. He's, he's delighted to be with us. And that delight is key to our identity. This love that's glued to us. So when you feel like you're struggling, he's glued to you. He's not leaving. He's faithful. It's covenantal. And I wish we could just keep unpacking that word. It's so massive. See what great love. This is not just gooey, mm, emotional love. This is love when all emotion is gone and God is glued to you. It's the love that we should kind of have with our parents when we're born and they goo-goo over us and they tell us how wonderful we are, the best looking baby the world's ever seen. Most babies are ugly when they're born, by the way. <clears throat> um, but it's that sort of love that gives us security and gives us identity and makes us fit in. And this is my people. It's a beautiful thing. When you walk into community here, there should be a love attachment. Because we're supposed to love one another. Not just this love one another. But love is so fickle. We get offended so quickly. Someone looked at me the wrong way, said the wrong word, and I'm offended. I'm out of here. Where's the glue? Where's the glue? 
See what great love the Father, this great revelation that Jesus brought, brought to the Jews was that this God, great God, Yahweh, was, a, was their Father. It's one of the reasons why the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the couldn't sees and the wouldn't sees hated him. Because he dared to call this great God Father. That's the great revelation that God is a Father. The Lord's Prayer, teach us to pray. Oh, great God of the heavens, creator of heaven and earth. Is that what it says? Our Father. He is all of that. But our prayer is our Father. My daughters didn't have to come to me and say, oh, greatest dad in the world, and they were lying, whatever. They just say, Dad, come on, Dad. Pull yourself together, Dad. There's an intimacy. This is what we can have with our Heavenly Father. Intimacy. I love it in, in, in Romans 8 where the Spirit says, it cries out that spirit of adoption, Abba, Abba. How great is the love of the Father, the Father, the Father. Isn't it amazing? The Father. I want to ask you if you struggle with that word, if you struggle with that relationship, or mother, actually, but if you struggle with that parental language, please talk with someone. Ask someone to pray with you. If you need help to, to unpack all of that because there's hurt or trauma, please get help. Otherwise, you're missing out on the key aspect of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And then we say Christianity doesn't work. It's not working for me. We've never interacted with Dad. This is eternal life. Not only that you would know Jesus and be saved by Jesus. This is eternal life. You would know God. Know the Father and the one whom he has sent. It's God's personal. In the Old Testament, that word Yahweh, when God gives his name to Moses, it's personal, it's deep, it's intimate. Read the story of Moses and, and God. It's so, so intimate. He's lavished on us. Can you say that word again? Lavished. lavished. You know, it's a real tongue word. Lavished. It means to bestow. It means to give as well. It means there's nothing to be earned. You, haven't, you don't have to do anything for it. It's given to you. It's bestowed upon you. But it's not like, oh, reluctantly, because of my son Jesus, I better give you a little bit of love. No, he lavishes it. Up. Just pause. Because it, he never runs out. Why doesn't he run out? What, what do you think is the main reason that he never runs out of love? Anyone want to guess? It's because who he is. Because love is ultimately a person. It's given to us in Jesus. But you'll look later when you get to chapter 4. Oh, 1 John chapter 4. It's glorious. Oh, it's it's, it's the, one of the most beautiful chapters in the Bible. God is love. That's why it just keeps pouring because God is love. And the main demonstration of that outpouring was his very best, which was Jesus. Jesus. He's going to keep coming. And his next very best as he wants to love our world is who? Us. He resources us as we go. He just keeps pouring in our grace and love. Just pours it out. It's lavished. It's not a dollop. Lavished. Say that word again. Lavished. Lavished. It's extravagant. And it's extravagant to you and I, to us. It's given it to us. 
that we should be called. So that's like a royal decree. You shall be this. You shall be a son. You shall be a daughter. Royal decree. Sealed. It's, the, it's that judicial legal statement. Son. Daughter at the moment of adoption. That's what you are. It's, that's it. Sealed. Done. You can choose not to walk into that. You can choose not to live like that. But that's what you are. Can you say that word again? Lav- lavished. He's lavished it on us so that we can be called the children of God. When, some, when, when, when a child is adopted, that child shall be called a son, a daughter of that family. They get that name. They get that rights. All the, they get it. It's done. That's what God has done for us. Uh, it's, a, it's what I believe he downloaded for me in, in a moment. I was his son. Now I have to walk into that, into the fullness of it, learn it, grow in it, experience it. But that's what I got. Genesis church is changing. Lots of babies are being born. And when babies are born, yeah, yeah they come and they, they, they get loved. Don't they? Do they know they're being loved? A little bit. But as they grow in the love, they grow in the understanding. Ah, I'm a son. Ah, I'm a daughter. They grow. Oh, that's my name. Yeah. Oh, I wish I didn't have that one. But no. <laughs> they grow in love. They grow in the understanding of who they are. Because your identity, you can't establish that by yourself. They tell us that identity is established of mirror neurons in your brain. It's what people tell you. That's why God had to say, you are my son. You are my daughter. That's what you are. Establishes identity. Identity establishes security. You can't be secure if you don't know who you are. That's why that verse is so important. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. Why? For that is what we are. Can you say that that's what I am? That's what I am. This is the most quotable verse in the whole Bible. It's got great words. Lavish. That's what I am. I've met many, many people with multiple degrees, theologians, they know, and they, can't, they haven't got this. And then I've met simple people that live on the side of a hill in India under plastic sheeting that have nothing, but they got this. They got this. When you are a child of God, it's a relational and a positional statement. It's not just oh, you're a son and a daughter. It's actually that you can have a relationship, interactive relationship. So this whole text is around identity and connection. And that is what you are. It's definitive. Last bit of that verse. The reason the world does not know us, that it did not know him. What's that saying? If people struggle with who you are in the world, it's because they don't know him, therefore they don't recognize you. Because you look like him. And you're growing more and more to look like him. Another reason this is so important is that you can realize when you, because we live out there, which is, anyone find the world pretty tough to live in? It's not, it's not an easy world to live in. But you have these people to remind you of who you are. These people can come alongside and say, no, that's what you are. I'm reaffirming your identity. I'm going to tell you that in here you are secure and you are safe. And from this place of security and this place of safety, you can be commissioned to go there. And this God who has lavished himself upon you, goes with you. 
Why? Because he's glued to you. He doesn't stay in the building when you go out. He goes with you. He's glued to you. Is that okay? I'll close with this. I've gone over my minutes. I wasn't even looking at that. Sorry. This is a lo- just, I wrote these things down. And then we're going to come to the table. Because the table is a reminder of who we are. It's a reminder of Jesus winning a victory. Verse 8, this is the reason the Son of Man appeared, was to defeat the works of the enemy, which is wanting to keep our identity hidden and to keep us disconnected from God. But the cross and the resurrection reminds us of who we are and empowers us to connect once again with God. So when we come to the table, that's what we are affirming. Jesus' victory over the works of the enemy to keep us from being connected to God. At least that's one key one. This is a love that saves. This love, this great love is a love that saves. It's a love that adopts. Just as I'm reading this, see where you fit into any one of these, and I've only got a few, there are many more, and maybe that's the part that you bring to the table this evening. It's a love that saves. It's a love that adopts. It's a love that transforms. It's a love that persists. It's a love that completes. It's a love that delivers. It's a love that forgives. It's a love that heals. It's a love that carries. It's a love that endures. It's a love that protects. It's a love that is victorious. Resurrection is a sign that love is victorious. And for those of you who have grown up in the last 20 years, it's the essence of Harry Potter. (laughs) That love wins. Love wins. I heard N.T. Wright say that the best Christian novels written in the last 20 years was Harry Potter. (laughs) Love wins. Whether you like Harry Potter or not. Love wins. As we come to the table, please don't do this. Oh, Sunday we've got to do communion again. Yeah, yada, yada, yada. I think when Jesus left, he left three things. He left disciples. He left the Holy Spirit, and he left a meal. He didn't leave the New Testament. It comes later, and we're so grateful that it does. But this meal is what he leaves his disciples. This meal is the reminder of everything that Jesus has done and who he is. Self-sacrificing love that he took upon himself. There's no child abuse here. He he said, I'll do it. And then rose again. What we remember, they tell us in the way our brains work, when we remember, it helps us anticipate the future so that we can live in the present. The future is about hope. Without hope, you, you can't have faith. Faith is so that you can receive grace in the present. So this meal is that we can remember So that we can anticipate that God is coming back, that He's going to complete it, and it gives us the strength, the courage, and the faith to live today and tomorrow. So, Father, as we come, I don't know how you do communion, everyone, how it happens. But, Father, as we come to this table this afternoon, may we be reminded of how lavish is this love that you have bestowed upon us in your son Jesus help us to remember so that we can look forward to that day you said we should eat this until you come we look forward to that day when it will all be wrapped up we thank you that you empower us to live today